Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today would usually be Michael Becker, but he is tied up on another acquisition of a multifamily property. So today in the podcast, we have the Loan Officers Roundtable. We do this on a quarterly basis, and it's kind of like uh, you're the fly on the wall, and it's, it's all of us kind of getting together, and we kind of talk a little bit about you know, what's going on in lending? What are some of the things that uh, we're paying attention to that you want to pay attention to? And so, uh, you know, please listen in and kind of join us in, in the conversation about what we think is important for you guys to know. So before we kind of kick off the podcast, I want to introduce a new member of our team that just came with us back about a month ago. And this is probably his first podcast to sit in on. And so I want to have you know him a little bit. Uh, He is an expert in lending. And so I'm going to have him tell you a little bit about his background and where you can see the true value of working with a professional like this gentleman. So in the podcast today, when joining us to the Old Capital team is Jonathan Farrell. So Jonathan, welcome aboard to the Old Capital Lending team. Thanks, Paul. So tell us a little bit about Jonathan Farrell. So Paul and I have known each other for two or three years now and have worked together on several transactions. Used to be one of the resources that Paul used uh, on the bridge non-recourse side. I've been in lending for about 13 years here in the Metroplex. Started off at a smaller community bank, privately held bank uh, here in the Metroplex. Was there for about eight years, did a lot of construction, all major food groups as far as uh, asset classes, so retail, office, industrial, a little bit of self-storage, and business lending as well for companies. And then uh, about four years ago, made a transition to a larger regional bank, again, here in the Metroplex. They're focused on non-recourse bridge financing, no construction, all the kind of value add and reposition but again, all major food groups as well, and a heavy emphasis on multifamily the last few years, just given all the uh, the activity in the market. So yeah, I uh, made a transition about a month ago, and idea there was just, again, we, was on a very good platform for what we did, but still very niched with what we did. So this is a, this old capital platform is, again, opportunity to be more all things to all people, and also expand the my market. I've always been a Texas-centric lender, you know, being with Old Capital will allow me to go more nationwide as well. So happy to be here. Well, we're glad that Jonathan made the transition. And Jonathan, you know, says a couple things I think are important. One is that uh, the bank that he moved from was really a Texas-centric bank, which means they only did transactions in the state of Texas, in in, maybe around the joining states, if you had a relationship. So this gives him an opportunity to go to other states and uh, bring his knowledge to help people that are looking for financing. So that's, that's a great piece. His background in uh, lending is tremendous, so I really encourage everybody to uh, spend some time and get to know Jonathan, too. So we appreciate him coming on board. So thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, Old Capital, I'll just put a plug in as an advertising piece, is that a lot of lenders are just one-trick ponies or so. I call Old Capital kind of the cheesecake factory menu of lenders. So not only can we give you uh, rigatoni, but we can also give you everything that you can think of on the menu. So we have lots of different choices how to structure and, and put these transactions together. So, James, what's going on in the market these days? What are some of the things that you're seeing in your, your neck of the woods? Sure. So we subscribe to a larger market service. And, um, you know, these these guys put together 25-page uh, market reports. And what I thought I'd do today is spend maybe a minute highlighting some of the um, key items in those reports sort of on a national level and then go down to the city level. So on the things that we're going to talk about is occupancy, rent growth, supply, and then sales. So on a national level, occupancy across the board is about 94%. Rent growth is about 2%. Average rent is about 1375 And on the supply side, we're seeing about 220 thousand units deliver in the last 12 months with 200,000 of those absorbed. So majority of the units are being absorbed right now. 
And then the risk that we're seeing on the national side is really on the, the high end side. And so it's really impacting class A, but there still is a shortage really on the workforce housing side, the B and C class. And so I think, you know, on a national scale, really seeing, you know, the case for class B, really seeing higher rents, higher demand, lower volatility. And a lot of people in the class B space have not been able to jump up, you know, into sort of home ownership. And so even though we've, we're in a long economic expansion here, the class B has been doing very well across the board. So let's jump into San Antonio. San Antonio occupancy is about 91%. They are seeing some class A deliveries right now, and they are seeing a jump to home ownership. And so San Antonio's median home price is about 200000 And so they're seeing people jump over on the home ownership side. Rent growth is still positive, about 1%. And then the supply has been pretty consistent with absorption. And so the pricing is still reasonable. I mean, Class A assets are trading at 5%. Bs are about 6 and Cs at 7 on cap rate. So San Antonio's still a pretty steady market and still growing. If you move down, you know, up to Austin, occupancy is about 92%. Rent growth is still positive at about 1.3. And the unique thing about Austin is a lot of people are coming in from more expensive metros. And so they're offering higher end class A properties. And the one thing that scared me when I read the report was developers have really stopped building the class A stuff in downtown and now they're switching to condos. And I always get scared when condos are going for 700 a foot in Texas and, you know, average price is six, 700,000 for condos in downtown Austin. So when I was back at GE, that was one of my first assignments when we stopped lending and really moved to the asset management side is I got a broken condo in Austin downtown. (laughs) And so I remember that one quite well. So not saying it's the beginning of the end, but. That's a scary thing when condos are going for that much in uh, a Texas city. And so sales in Austin, very competitive. Cap rates have compressed significantly. There's probably only a 1% spread between A, B, and C in Austin right now. So about 5 to 6% cap rates in Austin. And so let's go over to Houston. Occupancy here is about 90%, and that is the lowest since 2009. And this is really driven by the high number of deliveries. So rent growth is declining. It's been the third quarter in a row, negative rent growth. New supply is offering up to three to four months of concessions on their product to get it leased up. And so when you look at the number of deliveries in the last 12 months, it's been about 17,000 and they've only absorbed about 10. And then there's another 15,000 that are supposed to deliver in 2017. But then that number drops to about 5,000 in 2018. So cap rates are still, you're getting a little bit more yield on cap rates right now in Houston. So you're getting maybe 6% on A's, 7% on B's, and C's are 8 to 9%. A lot of local buyers are buying in the Houston market right now. A lot of the larger institutional capital is left. And so a little bit higher cap rate but you're having the stomach, maybe negative rent growth for the next 12 to 18 months on some of your class A product. The unique thing is that even though there has not been a ton of job growth, the population is still growing in Houston. So Houston was second, adding about 125,000 people in the last 12 months. So people are still moving to Houston. And so there's other job growth outside of energy in terms of healthcare, and then just the low cost of living. And then there's been a lot of sort of immigrant migration into that market. And so people are still moving to that market for other reasons besides jobs at this point. So, And then the last, last one, we'll finish with the darling of Texas, uh, DFW here. So occupancy is the highest of all markets, 93%. Ring growth, about 3%. And it's gone, you know, in some markets, the higher end markets, it's becoming flat to negative, such as, you know, uptown with the heavy supply. But, you know, really 1980s, 1970s sort of class B properties continue to drive rent growth. And the average rent right now is about 1100 and across all of DFW. And I like the play of just sort of, you know, buying a B, B class asset with 
you know, let's say 15, 20% below that average rent number and then bringing, you know, whether doing upgrades or improving the exterior and really bringing that up to an average rent number, I feel you're pretty safe in that market. And, um, you know, in the last 12 months, there's been about a hundred thousand new jobs to the market. And so people are still coming to Dallas for the new jobs. But the difference here is the supply is slightly over the absorption on new supply, but the starter homes for people to move into, I think they're just not being built. So at median home price right now in DFW is about 240,000 and prices on that end have increased significantly. I think, you know, probably about 50% in the last six years, single family home prices have come up here in Dallas. So it's harder for people to make that jump from A to a single family house, because I think I read one article, there was like the median home price is 200 and something thousand, but there's like four listings and they're, they're all pending right now. Hmm. So it's, it's pretty difficult to get into that market. We're seeing, you know, cap rates about the spread about four and a half on the A stuff all the way up to about six and a half on the C here in DFW. Hmm. Interesting. So again, what's the median price of a home? Here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, Dallas Fort Worth about two hundred forty thousand. So I was just reading an article in the New York Times talking about the median price of a home in California, five hundred thousand dollars. So that's a big number. Yeah. So there's the relative affordability here in Texas is still very high, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, I think across the nation, average homes about two forty. So Dallas was always lower. Um, it's come above that. Um, San Antonio and Houston are still below that number. And then Austin's about 280000 Okay. So just to give everyone a feel for the markets. All right. We'll come back to you a little bit, James. You can talk a little bit about uh, some other lending ideas, what's going on. Ricardo Hinojosa, what is going on in your world? Any words of advice for everybody? Yeah. How's it going, Paul? Good. I uh, thought I'd bring up a couple of things, just as kind of points of, uh, of advice or kind of tips that I would recommend. So the importance of property management. So we talk about property management all the time. Uh, We've had a number of companies here on the show, local property management companies. The importance of property management and getting them engaged early on in the process, especially with value-add deals. Sure. So deals where you're expecting a big shift in performance on the property. And we're going to be counting, you know, from from a lending standpoint, we're really counting on that pro forma to deliver for the deal to make sense, not only for the investor, but for the lender. So we've got to prove that up. So the importance of getting them boots on the ground early in the process uh, to be able to prove up your pro forma is critically important to the deal. They're going to be the ones that are executing your plan. So to make sure that you've got buy-off from them on where they can push rents, where they can take expenses is uh, extremely important. And, and, and you want to do that early in the process rather than later. You always right. want to get them engaged early. That's truly is a, is a critical thing because highly competitive market, whether it's Texas or Phoenix or you know Indianapolis, very highly competitive markets out there. You really kind of if you don't have experience in the marketplace and you just don't know, and and your broker, who's maybe the listing broker, is maybe rabbit holding you down a deal that, that you're going to have to pay overpay for the property. Mm-hmm. You got to make sure that the deal works on the numbers. Exactly. And, I mean, you may think you know how to do it, and the broker that may be representing the seller may be giving you information that it works on, on the way he does it, or the way she does it. But I also will tell you that uh, 90, 85, 90% of the brokers out there that list properties do not own multifamily properties. So they sometimes don't understand the complexities and what the expenses are, and they just kind of use market averages and and that they kind of make their uh, their point on how they on the market would would handle it. So I think Ricardo is absolutely correct to say that if you can get a property management company on the front side of the transaction and and Ricardo, you own a bunch of properties too. At what period of time do you really get a property management company talking to you? At the very beginning. Now when we start looking at a deal, We'll run some numbers ourselves. You know, we can look at comps. You know, I can run comps. A broker can run comps. But those are just numbers on a paper. We reach out to property management pretty early to make sure that we're looking at the right comps. And that, again, you know, they're, they're going to be the ones that, are gonna be, that, that, that will execute the game plan and really are going to be accountable for pushing those rents. So we feel like we, we've got to get buy-in pretty early. So that's kind of how we go about it. Yeah. You don't want to risk any money in these transactions if the, the if the deal truly does not work you don't want to be caught you know being chased down a rabbit hole 
that uh, you think it works, yeah. but it really doesn't work. And so uh, get the property management company to to do their analysis and help you understand how they would run the deal. Would you just do one property management company or would you do maybe one or two just to get a general consensus about how they look at it? Yeah, I think it depends where you're at. If, if you're if you're new to the game and you don't know the submarket and you're just getting a feel for things, I would reach out to at least two or three yep. that manage properties in that submarket. Right. You know, within a few blocks of 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 the property that you're going after. Um with us, for example, in the markets that, that we buy in, we've got a couple that we've used that we feel comfortable with that we know know the market. So, you know, we, we're pretty well set yeah. in terms of who we're gonna use. But especially if you're new to the market, at least two or three. Right. Just to get a kind of sense about what's going on in that marketplace, too. Absolutely. That's good. Uh, yeah. Anything on the lending side that uh, you're seeing some some concerns with? Not necessarily concerns, but we get a lot of questions. I've had a string of refis over the last couple of months okay. where uh, we put borrowers into you know bank bridge debt maybe a couple of years ago, a year or two ago. And why would you do that? Well, at the time, for whatever reason, it may not have qualified for, for Fannie or Freddie. Okay. It may have been the size of the transaction. Maybe it was a little under a million dollars. Um, occupancy may not have been a stabilized property at the time. It yeah. may have been too much of a value add deal for Fannie or Freddie at the time. So we put them into a bank deal. The general game plan is to obviously improve operations, where we pushing rents, occupancy, managing the property better, to drive the NOI, and then to be able to either sell for a profit or refi into longer term debt. So we get a lot of questions around, you know, the the timing of that, and especially over the last couple of years where we've seen such NOI appreciation really quickly, especially here in Texas. I get questions all the hey, I've owned the property eight, nine, ten months. It's doing great. You know, we've finished our rehab. The NOI is up. You know, how quickly can I refi mm-hmm. out of the deal? True. And there are a couple of nuances with Fannie and Freddie to be aware of. Uh, first, they want to they want to see that you've seasoned the the asset for at least twelve months. So that's kind of the minimum minimum requirement for Fannie and Freddie. They want to see that you've owned it at least 12 months. The next kind of hurdle is the two-year point. So between one and two years, they're really going to look at your, well, they're going to look at valuation, and you're going to be capped out at 75% loan to value. But they're also going to look at your all-in cost. And if you've owned it less than two years, they're going to want to see that you still have skin in the game. Right. So they're going to look at your purchase price plus rehab, and say, hey, they usually are going to max out at 90 to 95% of your total cost if you've owned it less than two years. So you really don't get that full cash out until after two years. So that's something to be aware of going into these deals, is that two years is kind of that sweet spot. So what happens after two years? Then you can cash out completely. Lenders are different, but in general, it's uh, it's around 130% where they're going to want to see. They're, they're not going to really take you above that point. Mm-hmm. But you, you can fully cash out after two years. Wow, so that's that's pretty good. So the first couple of years, they they even if you've executed your plan, and you go back and pound the table, listen, you know, or jumping on the table, yeah. and you want your cash out of your property because you said, hey, listen, nine months this property stabilized, give me the cash out. Mm-hmm. Freddie Mac is going to tell you uh, uh, no, but thanks for playing. Yeah. What they may do is they may just give you uh, after the first year, they may give you a percentage of that loan amount back so they'll just Correct. refinance the current balance that you have with the bank and do that with no cash out and then it becomes a certain percentage over a period of 18 to 24 months and then 24 months it's kind of it's it becomes kind of wide open then yeah. you can get out as much cash as you want after you've kind of proven up and stabilized the property and uh you know whatever you want to do with the cash whether you want to re- repatriate and pay back to your investors or buy another property i think they're pretty flexible with that exactly all right. Anything else that's uh, coming on that we need to talk about? Well, those are the two big points, big points. I wanted to touch on today. All right, great. Um, I'll let these guys jump in. All right, Dave, Dave Walls, what's going on in, in your world these days, Dave? Well, good morning, Paul, and everyone here. Well, I think James, he hit on a lot of uh, items that are very relevant in today's market and multifamily, so I won't dwell on those too much, but... Uh, what I'm seeing, first of all, is obviously we've got, you know, historically low cap rates, which, uh, you know, is, is the sign of the times. I mean, we all know that there's uh, an abundance of capital on the sidelines. Kind of multifamily is kind of one of the only games in town. Real estate investment is one of the only games in town 
not only nationally but globally. So that's creating obviously still a lot of uh, competition in the market. And so uh, buyers, when they're buying properties, have to be aware of that and make their offers as as, as strong as they can. There's all, obviously, with the, these deals are so tight that a lot of uh, buyers, a lot of borrowers are, are relying heavily on I.O. You've got to be careful there because when that I.O. runs out, if the market softens, then obviously it's the deals are going to be tight. So, But, you know, that's the way it is at the, at the moment with the pricing. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of reliance on getting as much I.O. as possible. What I'm also seeing is a lot of uh, a lot of my buyers are, and, and borrowers are, are chasing value-add properties, properties on the market right now that have been fully uh, rehabbed, that are you know fully stabilised, they're commanding top dollars, and there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of meat on the bone for uh, for, for investors. Uh, so what they're doing is chasing value-add in smaller tertiary markets. So I'm seeing a lot of that. The other thing is. The, I'm seeing a lot of green program in, in Fannie Mae. I'm seeing a lot of buyers who, you know, first of all, that you know, it's a good thing obviously to, to go for a green program, but they, they're obviously the deals are very tight. So getting a green program pricing with Fannie Mae, which can be you know a quarter of a point and even a little bit more off the interest rate, uh, makes it very attractive. But one thing I will say though, um, with the green program that Fannie Mae offers. When you're doing your due diligence, I back up here a little bit. A lot of a lot of borrowers to be competitive on a deal are um, going in with very short feasibility times when they're buying the when they're buying the property. Sometimes as little as as twenty days. So you know all the third party reports have to be in, and after that twenty day period, um, the you know the borrower has to evaluate the deal and and maybe go hard with six figures. But with the green program, you're relying on the seller and the seller's personnel to provide information from the utility companies. So you might have all your ducks in a row and all your lending side items put together, but you need to be chasing the seller to to keep on top of his game to make sure that he has all the green program information all put together in time um, so that it, it meets the feasibility day. So that's something to be aware of. It's something we're seeing lately. I'm seeing a, a lot of 1031 exchange money in the market, and that obviously puts a lot of pressure on property pricing. Um, you know, a lot of 1031 buyers are obviously they've got to get their their money into a deal, and so you know they quite often are okay with a 65, 70 percent loan to value. Uh, it's either that or they you know they they're paying Uncle Sam. So that's putting quite a bit of pressure on on property pricing as well. So as more and more deals have matured. As more and more deals are coming on the market at high prices because the owners are going to make a lot of money, they then have to either uh, put that money into something else. Uh, it's got to be a 1031 exchange vehicle. So obviously that ever-increasing amount of 1031 money that's coming in on the market is putting pressure on pricing as well for obvious reasons. Just a little bit, expanding a little bit more on what um, James was saying earlier. Um, in Austin, we're starting to see a little bit of softening in the in the Class A rent pricing, which is dribbling down a little bit through the other classes, but definitely not 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 as far down as into Class C. There is still a shortage of good Class C workforce housing product in Austin, and you know as property values keep increasing, there's a there's an ever increasing shortage of of housing for for the working class people down there. So it's still quite strong. There's still waiting lists on properties, and they're still getting great rents. Uh, so and that's probably the biggest thing right now across the United States is affordable housing. Period. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Fannie Mae is pounding the table to us and, and to you is that if you can do a transaction between you know five units up to fifty units for affordable housing, Fannie Mae will come down in pricing significantly. So five yes. to five to fifty units, you can get lower rates, uh, better leverage in these these transactions. So in the back of your mind, you know, look for properties about that size. Anything more to add to that, James? And if if it's over fifty units, but it's it's under five million, there's also some preferred pricing. Right. So you know, one of the things that that Texas has, it still has a lot of affordable housing. Really it does. If you go to areas like California, I was just reading an article that uh, you know, city of Los Angeles has about uh, nine hundred thousand multifamily units, just in the city of Los Angeles. And over uh, 700,000 or 78% are subject to 3% maximum yearly increases or or rent control on the property. 
So the vacancy rate in Los Angeles is, is, has dropped to 3.3. So the vacancy has dropped to 3.3 percent, meaning 30,000 units in the entire city are unoccupied at any time, and less than 7,500 of those are non-rent control, which is a, a, a pittance of a population of 4 million people and a growth rate of 1% a year. And, and so and the city itself has about 54% renters. So if you have rent control, you think you have affordable housing, but you're not going to have a lot of building going on there either. So we, you know, we, we continue to have building that kind of meets the affordable housing needs too. So Dave, anything more to, to add uh, in your neck of the woods? No, that's it really. I mean, it's uh, just really, I mean, the market is still, is still strong, for, uh, especially in, in Texas, um, and especially in the BNC product. Once again, we've said it before, obviously, you know, you as a, a buyer, you've got to make your offer competitive, make sure you've got all your ducks in a row before you start, because like Ricardo was saying, um, you know, make sure you have your management company lined up, get get numbers and pro formers and whatever you need to do up front, or you do diligence, because to be competitive with an offer, you're going to have a shorter due diligence period than you did a year ago. So the, the days of 30 to 40 days of due diligence are now squeezing down to 20. So it puts a lot of pressure on. So it means you've got to have more of your ducks in a row before you make a decision and go hard with any money. So, you know, that's just the sign of the times. All right. Dave Walls, thanks for the information. Jonathan, what's going on in your world? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to quickly comment on uh or add a comment to what Ricardo was talking about, the property management, bringing them early in their numbers. Really want to stress the importance, not only from the acquisition side and making sure that those numbers make sense for you to buy it, but then also those are numbers that you're going to give to your lender. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these value-add properties are going to be bank deals because they're not going to fit the underwriting for for the agency debt. And so coming out of that world, previously, you know, we relied heavily on those on those pro formas. Um, and you know, you, you want to be careful that that lender is going to structure a loan around those pro forma numbers. And so if they're blue sky numbers, you know, and a lot of, a lot of property management companies, it's a competitive market out there for them. So, and obviously they want to win business as well. Not saying they all do this, but you know, they're going to make those numbers say what they need to say sometimes. And so you want to just stress how good those numbers are. Cause again, when you go to get your rehab, dollars out from the lender. Mm -hmm. So you're closed and you're going through the process. There's going to be performance measures uh, that you've got to meet a lot of times to be able to access those dollars. And if you're not performing to that level, you don't get the money. So it's, you you can be strung out uh, with vendors or you, you know, if you don't have a working capital fund, you're going to have to go back to the equity to pay vendors until the performance is to a certain level. So There's just, I just want to make sure that you're all hearing that those are very important numbers that you get. And, um, and finding a, a great partner with a property management company is, is vital to these deals. Yeah. I, I, I can't stress enough with the property management company because, yeah, we trust you as a borrower. But if you've never done this before or this is your second deal, we're really going to rely upon that property management company right out of the box. And just like Jonathan says, you know, they may be blue sky, you know, happy smiles, and this is a great deal. But as, as Ricardo also said, maybe get a second pair of eyes and ca- kind of find out whether that is true. That, that uh, is it possible to run the property that way and make sure you always use the, the property taxes, what they're going to increase from you as a new buyer have to realize the property taxes are going to go up, and that could be a significant significant change anything more to add to that james not on that that particular note i mean let's let's kick it over to les and see what's going on in his his neck of the woods thanks james well i to play off earlier um mentioned that looking into more of the tertiary and secondary markets and i wanted to speak a little bit about the freddie mac uh, small balance loan program and they have acknowledged you know they're acknowledging that their our buyers are looking for a for yield, a higher yield, and some of that higher yield is requiring to go into tertiary markets and secondary markets. However, with some of that higher yield, it can have higher risk, and because of that higher risk, Freddie Mac has sort of tiered their programs. And so I guess keeping it simple for me is it's not the same old song for every city and every area you're looking at. Not the same old song, Les? What does that mean? Well, same old song is that you know, there's 
people have different tastes for different markets, and Freddie Mac is not alone. So if if you're in a top market, and they've divided them into to top standard, you make your top top 100, top standard, small, and very small. And if uh, you're in the top or standard, your maximum LTV is 80% um, for acquisitions and for refis. So it, it's, it's very easy. And again, thinking songs, if you left your heart in San Francisco or you love LA or Boston is your home, or you have those little town blues, New York, New York, you're in a top market and you're going to get the 80%. Max is what they'll judge on. But if you're in a small or very small uh, market, the max LTV is 75% for an acquisition and 70 for a refi. So thinking of, of the songbook, if you have a Tupelo Honey or you're an Okie from Muskogee, you're heading to Allentown, or you're wandering the streets of Bakersfield, you're going to be in the small or very small and have the reduced uh, leverage available to you. Now, not trying to leave out the middle market, that if your song is Tulsa or Memphis or Kansas City or St. Louis, you're in the standard market, and you still have the possibilities of the 80% LTV uh, for acquisition and refi. Remember, it's a different song for every market, and we at Old Capital have the songbook. So give us a call and we can let you know what song you're singing to as you're looking in the market. And you can call any of us here and, and we'll name that tune for what market you're looking at. But I think it's Freddie's way to understand that they want to be involved in all markets and share the risk with you. James? On the flip side of that, I mean, um, you know, Fanny, they definitely look at the size of the market, but the way they look at it is really pre-review or not. Right. So in these smaller markets that maybe Freddie considers small, very small and would limit your leverage, Fannie could do up to 80 percent in some of these smaller markets as long as it's not pre-review. So markets like Houston or Oklahoma City that are pre-review, it might be better to look at it. Freddie. Good point. Yeah. And there's also markets, too, that um, Fannie will not even go into because they may have too much of exposure in that marketplace. Or they think that the industry is is exposing their portfolio to risk. So, you know, what pops in the middle of my head right now is, is the market of Tyler. So Tyler, Texas, which is probably about what, 120 miles or so east of Dallas. Nice little community, I'm going to say. I, I really have no idea what the population is, but, you know, good-sized community, you know, university there. But Fannie Mae does not want to make a bigger position in the Tyler market. So just like Les says, is you know, we kind of have the uh, the songbook of all the different – areas in the country uh, and kind of figure out what the maximum leverage is, whether it is an acquisition or a refinance or, you know, or even refinance with cash out, we can kind of name that tune pretty quickly, pretty quickly. All right. Anything else that uh, we should be talking about or what's going on? I just said uh, one quick thing. I mean, right now in this market, there's a lot of acquisitions that I've been working on. And the struggle has been as people pay lower and lower cap rates on deals, it's becoming more and more difficult to size to the full 80%. That's right. Loan costs. So, I mean, the lenders are always going to be looking at the debt service coverage. So, you know, 125 debt service going in on a lot of these deals. And so a lot of times we'll give a term sheet, let's say it's seven and a half million dollars. And the broker is saying, well, the whisper price is nine million. And so everybody thinks they're going in at full leverage, but then by the time you get to best and final, it's 10 million right? or 10 and a half million. And so be prepared to bring more equity to the table in the week between the first offer and best and final, the property did not change. <laughs> the cash flows are the same. And so, you know, us, we can push the lender to see if they can get more proceeds on the deal. But as you go up two, three, four hundred thousand dollars on these prices, be prepared to show up with the equity at the table. Dave? Yeah, just to add to that, you know, when you're doing your, your numbers and your expenses and income performance for a property and figuring out, you know, you know, what it's gonna be worth to you. Always remember that, you know, you might come up with some glorious numbers with interest only. Hey, this looks really good for two, three, four years and you know, that's what I'm gonna be 
uh, selling to my uh, investment group and kind of here's what I think it's going to shake out at. But the uh, Fannie and Freddie will always do their pricing uh, and sizing on principal and interest. Just remember that. So a lot of people tend to forget that when they're, when they're doing their numbers. What are you seeing right now of a rate of return uh, to investors that people invest in multifamily these days, Ricardo? Or what are you seeing as, as rates of return? That's a good one because we, we, we get that question a lot, especially from new investors that are coming in. And they may not be new investors, but maybe they're syndicating a deal for the first time. And they're trying to get a feel for, okay, what, what do investors want to see? And you've heard it a number of times in this discussion today around how cap rates are compressing more and more. Well, that means, you know, rate of returns to investors are also getting compressed. You know, where we were a couple of years ago, investors were, were, were seeing low double digit pro forma returns, maybe within a two year, two year standpoint. Now we're seeing it's, it's more in the high single digits, even with interest only. So it's gotten tight. So I would say on a two year pro forma, it's more in the high single digits, 8 to 10% with IO mm-hmm. is kind of a, a sweet spot that people are looking for. Any fundamental changes going on with lending? Are you, are the, is it wide open still? Are you st- starting to see that uh, the shutters start to close, the, the garage door going down, the sign saying uh, we're closed for business on any of the, the lenders at all? No, n- not at all. I mean, it, it's still pretty open. Now, you know, to James's point earlier, they're, they're still looking at you know, key metrics, so debt service coverage, is you're still going to have to hit for, for Fannie Mae 125 going in. So that's not changing. The lending is there, but the, the constraints and, and the requirements to, to deliver are, are, are definitely still in place. Now that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type of stuff on multifamily. Jonathan, on you know, office retail, things like that, what are you seeing? I mean, since that, those transactions are not securitized in the secondary market, so those, those rates are not going to be as good uh, over long term, what do you see for office and retail and things like that? Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. A lot of these transactions are going to be, um, you know, life coke deals that are stabilized, CMBS deals that are stabilized. If not stabilized, if it needs to be repositioned or obviously new construction, those are going to be bank deals. You know, expectations on that are going to be obviously recourse uh, somewhere in the 65 to 75 percent range. Mm-hmm. Obviously, looking at uh, at sponsorship, their experience, uh, their financial wherewithal to get through those hurdles to stabilize a deal. But, you know, retail has the stigma that it's had for years now. That's a whole nother conversation on its own. But I, I do think that retail is still going to be a vibrant product type moving forward. Doom and Gloom has been on retail for the last 10 years, and it's still here. Mm-hmm. If anything, it's improving. I think that this the concept there is that people still just want to go out and, and have a shopping experience. Yeah. So, you know, Amazon is certainly a beast to deal with. But, you know, retail in and of itself, I think will change, but it's not going to go away. So uh, I think there's still going to be a a product there uh, for the long, long haul. I I think the common theme that we're, we're getting at with everything we're hearing is that we're in a great market, a lot of activity, a lot of buyers, not enough product, you know, and this is where one of those, you know, I, I started my career again, back in 2005 range, but really hit the lending platform in January of 2008. If you guys don't remember, that was a bad time to hit the lending platform. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just uh, a bad timing in the market. But the benefit that I got from that was, and still being in a, a lender through all that, was I got to see a bad market on the front end of my career. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of lenders in the marketplace today that have never seen a bad market. Right. They just think you make a loan and you get it repaid. And so going through that on the front end of, of my career, I really got to see – from the borrower side, the bad decisions that were made, you Mm -hmm. know, they were stretching on deals. They were paying too much. One of the things I always saw and make, you know, make a joke about is that I've never seen a pro forma that didn't work. Sure. Right. They all say a good outcome. Mm -hmm. So really getting into those numbers is key. The other thing that, that I hang my hat on is appraisals don't pay the loan back. They tell you what it's worth in today's market based on market conditions and cap rates. But ultimately, it does not pay the loan back. And so the performance of the property is what's going to do that. So don't think just because you get an 80% loan. I mean, that's a, that's a targeted number in, in today's market. And so you really need to really understand the sound investment decisions that you're putting into that acquisition or that refinance. You know, landlord-friendly environments, business-friendly environments, job growth, population growth. James hit a good point earlier, liking the concept that 
you know, you acquire property to bring the property up to current condition market economics, not to exceed the market. That's where you get in trouble because the music stops. We're all playing musical chairs here. So the music stops and the market hiccups, you know, everybody thinks they have the prettiest baby, but ultimately a lot of these properties are all going to be sized the same and, and, and feel the same hiccups that the market feels. So I think it's just the key takeaway is no deal is better than a bad deal. So don't stress yourself of trying to find a deal and wavering on your fundamentals of how you underwrite. It's better to walk away than to make a bad decision because that's where you start to lose money versus just missing a deal. Right. Some great insight from uh, Jonathan Farrell. Some great information from Les Meisel, the guy with the songbook. Great. But I can't carry a tune. That's right. Great information from Dave Walls, uh, Ricardo Hinojosa, and then uh, James Ang. Talk a little bit about what's going on in October, and you know, give us a little more, of, you know, a little, little feel, a little color to that uh, conference. Sure. So Thursday, October fifth, here um, in Dallas, we're going to be hosting a conference from about ten a.m. to seven. Really wanted people to come in and meet the players in the industry. And so it's taken me probably two, two and a half years to meet all these people. And in one day you can do that. So that's the the crux of the conference is, you know, the top four or five listing brokers in the market, all the property management companies that we work with that you should be working with if you're not working with. Um, you can meet them there as well. And then we'll have lenders specifically from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and some of the local lenders, and then owners. So there'll probably be, so far we have about 200 people who have signed up to come, and we have about 100, 150 more seats. So if you have not registered, you can go to oldcapitalpodcast.com. That conference and, is still, what, three, four months away, and we already have 200. Yeah, so <laughs> two-thirds of the seats are gone. So if you want to get your seat, the, go on to Old capitalpodcast.com on the right hand side you can see the button to register and you can reserve your seat that's great some good information now you know we kind of talk and walk the business i mean i can't think of another group of originators like us that uh, has more experience with a higher depth of knowledge about multifamily office retail than than the old capital team so we appreciate you guys uh, listening to us again if you want any information on multifamily side and you want to get a little information about the white paper Go into the Old Capital Podcast, and there's a place you can click on, and it'll download for you or get pushed over to you as an email. Is the 15-page white paper report on Multifamily 101. That's what you really want to get. And then also, too, is that Mike Becker's due diligence report. I think that's a real good report that what Mike uses. The last thing is that if you do like the podcast, uh, go back into iTunes Give us a five-star report if you think we're doing a good job. Again, we're not advertising. We're just telling you how, you know, What's going on in the market? I mean, uh, there are some podcasts that go, they have theories of how this stuff works. We have about uh, six, seven hundred million dollars a year in uh, lending. So we kind of know what's going on. So make sure you give us a call if there's any questions that come up on in terms of financing or buying multifamily properties or office or retail. So, guys, we appreciate you guys coming into the podcast today, the Old Capital Lending team. We appreciate it, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.